I'll talk today about um, modern methods of factoring. Uh, well, unfortunately, they are now very modern because the main advances in this uh, direction were in 80s and beginning of 90s and just the recent factorization records that we have seen are just application of these uh, methods to uh, increase in computed power, computing power that is in hands of researchers in academia and so on. So I'll try to give some overview without going deep into math, just a bit deep so that if you later would like to learn a bit more, uh, this material may uh, serve like a basis. But I will also publish uh, some uh, additional material uh, on uh, Google Drive with some simple explanations of number field sieve and similar methods, uh, which can be helpful if we in the future decide to um, explore uh, this uh, harder perspective of these things more details. Okay, so feel free to ask uh, questions in, uh, in between. So uh, what's actually the problem of factoring? Let's formulate it. And it is, so suppose we have uh, a big uh, number, capital N, uh, which has uh, N bits, uh, small n. And uh, the problem of factoring is to find its prime decomposition. So find its uh, factorization into prime powers, and this factorization for integers is known to be unique up to the order of factors, but there cannot be different uh, decompositions uh, with the same order. Uh, this is actually the property that factorization is unique is important because it doesn't exist everywhere. And for example, in fields, it's of course not the case because in field, every element is divisible by anything else. and in field, every field element can be uh, present, can have like multiple infinite number of representations. But it's property uh, of the ring of integers, uh, of the ring of polynomials, and of some other so-called Dedekind domains, uh, which includes some uh, funny uh, algebraic fields, which are basically uh, fields where you, uh, extension fields where you add some roots of certain polynomials or some uh, well, square roots of uh, negative numbers and so on. There are some uh, fancy uh, sets where factorization is unique and this is used to some extent in factory methods, but not everywhere. Uh, that's because, and uh, because of that, uh, many, uh, well, uh, even though, for example, discrete logarithm problem is related, uh, but uh, in the sets where uh, there is no unique factorization, uh, many uh, methods uh, do not uh, really apply there. Okay, uh, let's go on. Uh, so um, if the uh, number cannot be factored, uh, it's called prime number and it's relatively easy. So it's, uh, there exist deterministic algorithms which are polynomial in the number of bits that determines if uh, number n is prime. Uh, factoring is of course uh, an NP problem because uh, you can quickly check that uh, factorization is correct, but it's not known to be NP-hard. And I think, as far as I understand, many people believe that it's not NP-hard. And due to that, uh, algorithms faster than just pure exponential exist. But on the other hand, purely polynomial algorithms do not exist. So we do not know where, where it really is, this factoring problem. Uh, oh, how, how can we simply factor? So we just go over all uh, numbers up to the square root of n, and if number is prime, we test if it divides uh, n, and uh, of course, when we exhaust all the numbers up to the square root, we exhaust all the uh, all the uh, numbers, all the factors, and what what remains, it can be bigger than square root of n, but it it must be prime. Uh, it must be a single prime that remains, and complexity of this is about square root of n. That's trivial methods. Uh, uh, a bit more interesting method that related to uh, methods I will discuss is the following. So suppose you generate uh, two numbers, x and y, and then you test if x square equals y square modulo the number that you're gonna factor. Why is this equation interesting? Because if this happens, if this holds, 
then if we like put y squared to the left side and apply the simple formula, then we see that there is a product of numbers that equals zero modulo uh, the modulo n, so modulo numbers to try to factor. And there is certain chance, actually quite high chance, that if we, that uh, either of this is uh, uh, actually not n itself, but some factor of n. And if we compute the GCD of x minus y and n, or x plus y and n, then it's very likely that we actually get a factor of n. Otherwise, uh, so if this doesn't hold, then we go to step one and generate and new numbers. But in general, if, if this holds, then we almost win, uh, with usually with probability more than uh, one half. So if these numbers are uh, small enough. And by proper arranging x and y, we can make the complexity about square root of n again. Uh, why is this important? This is important because I will show how we can generate x and y in much more interesting way. And that's actually how uh, factoring uh, becomes easier than uh, square root. Uh, how exactly? Um, okay, um, so we generate x and y so that the equation is more likely to hold. And this is in the advanced uh, factoring methods. Uh, now there is some interesting stuff. Uh, suppose that uh, for some number x, xi bigger than the square root, it happens that if we compute the square of x and take it modulo n, and we have some number z, then it factors into powers of two, three, and five. Just two, three, and five. So some two to the some power of a, ai, three to some power of bi, and five to some power of ci. Uh, so we can actually factor z. So we try for every z that we compute this way, if it factors into this, into two, three, and five. Uh, and uh, what's interesting, interesting that if we collect sufficiently many of such numbers, and well, if you have three factors, then uh, if, yeah, uh, then I need four such relations. Why is that? Because if I collect four different relations like this with sufficiently big x, uh, bigger than square root, then uh, what happens if I have four such relations? I can compose a matrix where the powers of uh, uh, these prime factors are in the matrix. And then I seek for linear combination mode two, modulo two. Uh, why modulo two? Because this basically means if uh, some, for example, if some column, uh, if we sum up, uh, for example, some rows and there is zero, modulo two, this basically means that uh, these uh, numbers sum to some even number. And this basically means that if I multiply uh, this zi, zj, zk, del together, if I multiply them up, then uh, this uh, exponents, uh, they will add up. This will be even number. And this means that this will become a square. Uh, and the same will happen um, for three. So if uh, this we uh, collect sufficiently many elements in this matrix, uh, then uh, with big chance, there is, a, of course, a linear dependency, modulo two, uh, and uh, there exists uh, a sum of rows with alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, uh, zero or one, so that the, this uh, linear combination gives uh, zero, 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 uh, modulo two. If this happens, then, uh, for example, yeah, the, there exists this alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Uh, then we know that if we take uh, x i to the alpha, x j to the beta, x gamma, to, uh, x k to the gamma, x l to the beta, to the delta, then the square root of these guys, uh, the, the, the square of this product, if we put this here, then uh, it will translate to some, uh, when everything sums up, so in this vector, we'll get so some u2 here, 2u2 here, 2u3 here, 2u5, uh, basically here. And if modulo 2, this all gives all zeros. And then uh, this means that uh, we have now 
the product of squares into some uh, power. So instead of having uh, two to the something, three to the something, five to the something, now have four uh, to the something and so on. And this basically means that this is the square and this is the square. Both are squares and we, we get this V and W this way. And uh, uh, we get this equation that uh, we were looking for. So there, for example, uh, for example, suppose that we uh, would like to factor number 143. Uh, and I take uh, square root of 143, which is uh, smaller than uh, 12. And I uh, compute powers of uh, this number size so slightly increase and compute so 14 square, 15 square, and 16 square, they do not, they're not divisible by two, three, and five. But 17 square is just three. 19 square is 75. Uh, 21 square is, uh, if I take all this model of 143, and 21 square is, uh, uh, yeah, 441 equal 12, uh, which is uh, two times uh, three square and so on. And uh, if we note, uh, then, uh, so if you look at this, then uh, if we uh, multiply 17 by 19, then uh, their squares, for their squares will happen that we'll have three by three and five squared two. So 17 times 19 squared equal to three square five square, uh, which basically means that uh, 30, uh, if we take this, uh, modulo 143, we have that 37 squared equal 15 squared. So we put this to the left side, uh, apply a simple formula and see that uh, there is a, indeed uh, equal, equal zero modulo 143, we compute GCD and we have 11. And 11 is the factor of 143. Uh, any questions so far? Well, this is super cool because super simple. Um, one question I have is, is it still the case that the probability that uh, that V and W kind of won't be equal? Or like the GCD just doesn't give you any prime? Yes, there is a chance that GCD doesn't give you, but in practice, it's, it's quite low. So I think with probability this one half, uh, if you get this like equation with the random v and w if they are both sufficiently small then i think with uh, with very high probability uh, you have uh, you get an actual factor and are, are these like provable things or like heuristics yeah i think this is provable i think for for sufficiently small v and w for which this happens you can rigorously prove that the probability is very high And what do you mean by sufficiently small? Uh, sufficiently small, I think smaller than n. Uh, so, well, if they are like close to square root or if uh, one of them is closer to square root, uh, then I think you can bound this. I, I've seen some estimates how you can compute it. I think it's widely assumed that the probability is about one half that you get correct thing because actually it may happen that uh, this you, you don't get uh, you don't get the answer only if uh, only if uh, one of this is uh, bigger is uh, uh, multiple of n right so if, it, if right. this is n or if it's 2n or 3n but right. if x and y are both smaller than n, then probability of this is small, right? Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So this method is very nice, but the problem is that the number, the fraction of numbers uh, divisible by two, three, and five is very small. And we have to adjust this method somehow to, to benefit from this. So the matrix part that we like uh, looked for linear dependency is very simple because only three factors. But we have tested, so if you see that I, for example, tested 
uh, 20 numbers and only in four cases I got a nice uh, decomposition. Uh, so the smarter method of factoring uh, introduced uh, what's called uh, smoothness and we call number zero B smooth if all its factors are smaller than B or like smaller or equal to B. Uh, and in, in our case, if we say that it's like smaller than B, then clearly uh, the previous case, when we considered only two, three, and five, we talk about uh, six smoothness. But of course, we can consider bigger uh, smoothness value. So how this is, how this works, we take some X, I'll tell later how we take this X, we compute X square, model Z and test if it's B smooth. So we select some number B and test if it's B smooth. If yes, we add it to our table and this is called seeding. If we find uh, about B, well, B over logarithm of B uh, to be formally, uh, then if we find about B such X, then we have a matrix with, uh, so, we, we can, uh, so if it's B smooth, then in our table of exponents, uh, there are at most uh, B uh, columns because every column corresponds to exponent of some prime and there are at most B primes here in this interval. So in our matrix, there will be uh, B columns, B over L and B. Uh, and if we find about B such X, then after applying, for example, Gaussian elimination to the matrix, then we can find some linear dependency. And basically it, it, we will see that uh, in pretty much the same way that some product of squares. So product of squares gives you uh, another square. And uh, when we aggregate these guys and take it modulo n, then we have x square equal y square and we are uh, done. Um, so what's the complexity of this? Uh, principle. So basically the metric step, uh, we work with matrix B times B, but interesting that we don't need B cube uh, operations to find uh, linear dependency, to find basically an element of the kernel because the matrix is very sparse. And uh, interesting there are special algorithms called block Wiedemann or block Lanzos, algorithms for sparse matrices that find uh, uh, elements of uh, care of kernel of uh, sparse matrix, and usually, um, so this uh, algorithm works in about b square times well the sparsity somehow. So it's about b square, and uh, this is one step that uh, of course can be uh, improved in hardware. So. So uh, there will be improvement to sieving, but the metric step, I can already tell that uh, there are several suggestions how to make this, this thing much faster and much more efficient than hardware. So this can be considered independent of the sieving part, the com uh, very complex part of a number field sieve. But this thing is uh, theoretically very simple and can be explored, I think, relatively easy how fast it can be on uh, custom hardware. Uh, to run this algorithm or modifications of this algorithm so that are suitable for multiple cores, something like this. So what about seeding step? The seeding step, of course, all depends on uh, this number Z because uh, uh, the smoothness uh, probability for a number, it depends how big the number is because clearly the, if the number is smaller than B, then probability that it be smooth is one. But when it increases, there is a very big chance that the, it has a big prime factor. And because of that, uh, more and more numbers are not this smooth. So the probability decreases significantly uh, with the grow, as Z grows. And uh, we have to take this into account. So um, the sevens, uh, for seven, we need uh, B uh, such numbers. And uh, to you know, basically the uh, complexity to find one number is uh, the fraction of B smooth numbers uh, uh, among our outputs uh, for given Z. 
and uh, multiplied by the complexity of test. So how, how expensive it is to test that Z is smooth. But actually, uh, what's really interesting that uh, the modern sieving methods, they are quite fast in a smooth test and they uh, may take into account the benefit the fact that uh, we created Z in a very special way and the amortized cost of smoothness uh, test is, is very low. So what's, what's really, really important here is this probability. Uh, the probability that this number is smooth and the smaller we can make this number, the bigger probability it is that it be smooth. And uh, of course, since the metric step is about of B square, we would like that this be of B square uh, to, so that both steps are balanced. And uh, if we uh, make the com test complexity uh, almost one or close to one, uh, then uh, the trade-off is where the smoothest probability is uh, one over B. But it of course depends how big Z is. So uh, the smaller Z is, the bigger we can take this uh, B and the bigger numbers we can uh, basically factor. Uh, questions so far? Yeah, so actually um, I like to stress that this smoothness uh, property is very, very important thing. It's uh, actually why uh, factoring is uh, much faster than brute force uh, factoring that square root of n is because we can, uh, in integers, there is this, exists this notion of uh, uh, smoothness and there are uh, numbers that factor uh, this way. So in, in other sets, we don't have this notion and because of that, uh, problems similar to factoring like discrete log are much uh, harder there. So this is the crucial property uh, for factoring. And what's the typical size of uh, B that we're talking about if we want to factor like uh, 800 bit number or something? Uh, so you see that we make uh, both uh, we, we would like for trade-off we would like that uh, the time of both steps is O of B square. So if you can spend two to the 60, uh, two to the 60 uh, time, uh, then your B is two to the 30, clearly. All right, okay. Now I understand why the matrix is sparse. Yes, so um, numbers are like, uh, 30 uh, to the 30, so 30 bits. And of course, uh, uh, they have don't have too many prime factors. So they can have like average number, I think in recent records, like 50 or 100 or something, uh, not terribly many. So compared to the size of the metrics, uh, the number of uh, non-zeros is very small, like one, yeah, you can imagine like 100 over 30, very small. So you mentioned that there was some suggestions to use A6 for the, the matrix step, but what about the seeding step? Yeah, so what about the seeding step? I'll have to go how exactly seeding uh, works uh, in, uh, in two algorithms in quadratic sieve and number field sieve. And then I will explain so how uh, hardware will help there. So about the smoothness, uh, how we get actually this uh, faster uh, factoring this than faster than square root. Uh, it's uh, for example, if uh, B is constant, like six we have used, then probability that the number is B smooth is uh, uh, one over N to the uh, uh, logarithm of B. Uh, but uh, if, uh, if B is uh, this big, like uh, exponent of square root of logarithm, so we, which is not like logarithm by half, but square root of logarithm, then the probability that the number is smooth is one over square root of B. And because of that, uh, if we, uh, to find B such numbers, we spend B to the three over two time and the metric step is B square. So by further tuning this number, we can 
a range that uh, numbers are factored with about this complexity. Uh, how uh, I will be a bit more precise in the uh, next algorithm, which is called quadratic sieve. So what's interesting about quadratic sieve, it's, it can be explained relatively uh, trivially compared to number field sieve. So what's in the quadratic sieve, what we are doing? So the first nice step is how we select our x. If we select x close to square root of n, so square root plus some epsilon. So of course, this is the uh, integer part of square root. Then if we compute x square modulo n, then if we took n square modulo n, so this will become almost zero. And what remains is uh, epsilon square and two epsilon uh, times square root of n. Now this makes uh, our number z of size about square root of n. And because of that, it's much more likely that it's b smooth uh, compared to random z modulo n because number that is uh, half of digits of n uh, is much more likely to be b smooth. So uh, we're gonna find uh, or of b over logarithm b such x. We construct our equality of square equality and we are done. But uh, how to test smoothness? And for smoothness test, it's uh, interesting. So we basically uh, try x and we have arithmetic progression here. So if we test b squared, then we take uh, square root of n uh, plus one, square root of n plus two, and so on, plus b squared. And how we work with that, so why it's called quadratic sieve, um, we test bit smoothness as follows. So suppose that, let's take some prime uh, smaller than b. Um, then we solve an equation that uh, x squared minus n equals zero modulo q. Uh, and for x somewhat closer to square root. And uh, we can solve it because uh, in, uh, if it's prime, then such equations are uh, solved easily. There are polynomial algorithms to do that. And if we solve that, then for any k, we have that if we, add to x q or 2q or 3q, then modulo q, there will be all the same. Meaning that if q of x divisible by q, that means that q of x plus kq is also divisible by q. And coming back to uh, the previous slide, so remember we constructed uh, x uh, square minus n, for x, which is arithmetic progression. And this means that for some first element, so how to find smooth numbers here, we uh, take one number, uh, one prime, and we find here uh, the root. Uh, we find, we solve for some x in the beginning of this equation, x squared minus n equals zero modulo q, we solve it. And then, so suppose this, this is true for this number. But, and, uh, and then this means that if this is divisible by Q, then we can add to the argument any multiple of Q and with uh, like an arithmetic progression in equal gaps, the outputs of our polynomial will be divisible by Q. And we can divide it by Q like a ratus van sieve and eventually, if we repeat this many, many times for different Q, some numbers will boil down to zero to one because we factor out all the prime numbers of them. So how this sieving works is that we, in, in a very long array, we find some number to start with and then every Qth number we divide by Q uh, and we know it will be divisible. And we repeat this for, for all the prime numbers and eventually what remains uh, are, uh, there must be about B numbers out of B square that are ones and these guys will be uh, B smooth. Questions? I wasn't really able to follow the last few steps. Okay, so uh, do you want me to repeat or you want later to uh, take a look into the formula? <laughs> 
I think I get it. I think uh, the idea here is basically that instead of like just sequentially trying random numbers, what you do is you sequentially try numbers that are multiples of some uh, smooth number, and so that way you have a um, of like some small to medium sized uh, smooth number, and that way you have a higher chance of hitting something where the entire number is. Uh, yes, that's more or less the case. Uh, so to summarize it shortly, we find one number here that is divisible by prime by solving an, uh, an equation. And then we know Just that- Just to clarify, we do that for each prime less than B. Yes. Step. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. For each okay. prime less than B. Okay. And then so we have uh, the list. We have the list of all these numbers that are squares of root n plus one up to root n plus b squared. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And among them, some some of them are divisible by by a prime. We know that we we have found uh, one such number. So we we solve this modulo q and uh, we find some, such x. So this is easy to find such x. Mm -hmm. This means that for any prime, it's easy to find in this sequence which ones are divisible by this prime. So, so this is like Eratosthenes sieve, basically. Yes, it's, right. it's mm -hmm. the same Eratosthenes sieve, but viewed in a bit different way. So mm -hmm. in Eratosthenes sieve, you, you have like prime three and you, you cut out three, six, nine, and so on. But here you cut not three, six, nine, but you have to start from somewhere in between from like 47. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you figure out that uh, Q of 47 uh, is divisible by seven and then uh, you divide Q of 47, then Q of 47 plus 7, 54, 61, 68, and so on. So in equal gaps, you find numbers that are divisible by this prime. And you divide, so you basically like override, and then you repeat with another prime, it will give you another arithmetic progression. So, so and, and you divide um, you divide until it's not divisible. So if it's divisible by 49, you will divide by 49. Yeah, but 49 is not a prime, so you it's right, right. But if you if it's divisible by seven, right? So yes. you find all the ones, but some of them might be dis divisible by seven squared, seven cubed, and so on. Yes, I think yes. Uh, they recommend to divide to try divide it further. Okay. So you, you indeed divide it. And basically it. then you do that for all the primes and find all the numbers that you've re reduced to one. Yes. Okay. Okay. And because of that, the amortized cost of testing one number for smoothness is not that high. So how does it compare to the kind of trivial constructive method where you just try a random Z? Uh, it's much better because the num these numbers are relatively small. So this they are about square root of n. Right. And because of that, uh, the probability for them being b smooth is much higher. And this basically means that we can uh, we can take this smoothness bound uh, with with the same smoothness bound as before. We can attack much bigger numbers. Uh, so, because if uh, in in regular method, uh, if Z, if for example, you can spend like two to the 60 time, and then uh, for random Z, uh, the probability to be a smooth is two to the minus 30, for example, and you can break, I don't know, 200 bit numbers with this complexity. Then, since in the new method, Zs are uh, of size square root of n, that basically means you cannot attack twice bigger numbers, roughly. Right, so but there's kind of two tricks, right? One trick is to make sure that your Z has uh, half the bit size. And then there's the other trick, which is the sieving trick. Presumably, you could keep the first one, but not do the sieving. 
Yes, so the saving gives just kind of, it amortizes the test cost, but I think even trivially, the test cost is not that high. Well, if you do it like stupidly, uh, then you have like B numbers, uh, if you have like B smoothness, you, you have B square numbers, and you test everyone uh, for B smoothness, you have to try B factors, right? So you, have, you spend B, fact, B divisions, trial divisions for this, B trial divisions for this, and so on. So eventually you spend like B cube. So if there's a time memory trade-off here, right? So like basically, um, if, you, if you do what Justin said and not do the second step by sieving, but with a trivial way, then you can probably do it with much less memory and more locally. Yes, yes, uh, that's, uh, that's certainly true. Uh, there are even faster methods in the very end of this, like an extra method called elliptic curve factoring that allows you to find small factors faster. Uh, it allows you to like, if you know that your factor is small, then you can find it, whatever it is, faster than by just trial division. So you can optimize using this trick as well. Uh, so there are of course very quite many optimizations here, and uh, the fact that uh, so how how you can exploit this in hardware. So you recall what I said about arithmetic progression that we uh, do this even using arithmetic progression. So we access memory in a very predictable way. So we we take this number, then we step by uh, this prime that we divide by, then again and again. So all these steps are pretty predictable, and it's possible to to share this task among several cores. And there, this is quadratic sieve. Uh, the modern methods called what uh, use what's called lattice sieve, but they all share pretty much the same strategy. And memory accesses here are very predictable. And uh, I think uh, after you have generated these uh, numbers, you can properly share them among uh, your smaller computers. So ev like everyone can do their task to uh, filter out uh, the, uh, to find uh, smooth uh, outputs. Does it make sense? Uh, this is the second crucial point I wanted to make, that uh, the sieving step is uh, very predict, even though it requires quite a certain amount of memory, it's, it's very predictable. And of, you can even compute these guys on the fly, uh, and uh, you can divide this into segments and do this process kind of independently for different segments, just you bit lose into the uh, total complexity, but uh, you can save uh, a lot of memory for every single core. Right. Okay. Uh, so uh, the so we proceed, and uh, yes, interestingly, so the optimal B is uh, e to the uh, half. Uh, e to the square root of half logarithm of n. Uh, I will not uh, compute it directly right here. So because of the square roots, this all these uh, complex estimates are a bit odd and not uh, trivial to state. Um, but the thing is, so since b is this way, then the total complexity is b square. Uh, this basically means that when you square this, uh, you have uh, a 2 instead of 0 0.5. Uh, under the square root, basically that's complexity of quadratic C. And uh, the next advanced method is uh, called number field sieve. And number field sieve uses very sophisticated algebraic tricks to make uh, this number even smaller. So all the rest is almost the same, but they manage to have this z even smaller than square root of n. They make it like uh, some root of n, which is not like square root, but something in between like 2.5 or cubic root, it depends. But uh, after they, if they can, if they make it like smaller, the smoothness probability greatly increases. And because of that, you can attack bigger numbers. That's the core advantage of the number field sieve. And how they do it, so this unfortunately involves uh, quite a bit of algebra. Uh, uh, let me just state the main points here. 
and maybe later if you would like to understand a bit better you can return to this but uh, what's important here is that algebraic part doesn't play almost any role into the like computing this in hardware so pseudo code doesn't change significantly from the number from the quadratic sieve and the properties of uh, architecture needed uh, to break the number with number field sieve is almost the same as the for the quadratic sieve. So you can have understanding of quadratic sieve and build uh, ASIC for quadratic sieve, it will be quite efficient for number field sieve as well. So how number field sieve works? Uh, first, they take some polynomial of small degree, uh, if concrete numbers about five or six, uh, so that uh, it has or some root that we know modular n. And this polynomial actually can be derived rather trivially. So we can imagine, so this number, so if, if this is five, then clearly this number should be about uh, five, fifth root of n. And so we can imagine that if we take a digital representation of n and divide it into five uh, segments and have this ML representation of n, then we can find such uh, polynomials. So such polynomials are literally trivial to find and there are many of them. Um, uh, suppose also that uh, if we consider not modular n but just over integers that it has some root uh, which we denote by alpha. So by default it's probably not uh, divisible. Uh, it doesn't have any uh, real roots uh, and actually if it does then it probably we can find the factor of n. Uh, trivially. So we assume it doesn't. And then uh, what we can do is uh, that if we have LA any polynomial or uh, which are built over alpha as variable uh, and if we substitute into this polynomial the number m we actually get a homomorphism from the set of polynomials to integers. And this nice homomorphism it has very nice properties uh, that basically if, uh, if for some uh, set of uh, numbers A and B, we consider simultaneously uh, AI uh, minus BI alpha, where alpha is this root, uh, and we consider A minus BM. So we try to find A and B such that this thing is, so this thing is smooth. And because of that, we can find that some product of these guys equal Y square. In parallel, we do the same, but in the algebraic number, in the algebraic number field. And we try to find uh, smooth uh, numbers of this kind. And if they are smooth, then this product is, uh, uh, we can find that using the same linear algebra, we can find it equal to beta square. And if it is equal to some beta square that we know, but we haven't computed it yet, then it's possible. So there are some sophisticated algorithms that compute the square root in uh, Q of alpha, but not for every number, but only for numbers, only for the elements that are squares. So it's not like in the field where you can compute square root, but uh, it's uh, in some uh, ring of algebraic integers where you can compute square root when it exists. And if these two things hold, then uh, basically you can apply our homomorphism to beta square and you will have x square. And on the other hand, if you apply homomorphism to uh, this product, then you will have uh, product of AI minus BIM, and if and we know that we have found that A and B so that they equal to Y square, so that eventually you have X square equal to Y square. And what nice here is that well we have we search for A and B so that this number is smooth and this number is smooth as algebraic number, and we can make them rather small. So that's the the main trick that. Uh, if A and B are small enough, then M is also small enough. We remember that it's some root of N. And so this guy is small and this guy is also rather small. So even when the, even though we need that both of them are smooth, this probability is much higher than for the Z that we searched before, 
that is smooth. And if both of them are smooth, uh, then uh, and if we sufficiently find sufficiently many that A and B, then using the same linear algebra trick, we find X square and Y square. So that's basically the core of uh, number field C. So uh, to summarize, even if you don't understand anything like I did many, like first 10 times I, <laughs> I read about that. So uh, the main property is that uh, we work in two uh, areas simultaneously, in integers and in algebraic integers, and we manage to have our numbers both like smooth in both places. And Sorry, algebraic yes. integers, should that be Q of alpha or Z of alpha? Oh, well, these are rational, but... Uh, okay. Yes, uh, I think that, well, uh, the mode, I think this, we can view them as uh, actually, uh, Z of alpha because, uh, well, these guys are always uh, integer in our case, I believe. So actually, this all uh, probably should be, uh, I think this Q should be. So here the homomorphism uh, is, uh, uh, works for Q, but I think uh, uh, it's uh, all the further uh, explanations, they are over Z over alpha. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, uh, so basically we just to find smooth uh, elements of this set, indeed of Z over alpha, is not not trivial because we cannot divide that easily in that uh, field. But what we can do is we can again map this number to integers uh, using simple formula so we substitute this to the polynomial that we have. This is called a norm. And fortunately, the norm is multiplicative. So if this guy is a square, uh, then so is uh, the norm. So what we basically do is uh, we uh, find uh, a norm uh, which is B smooth. And uh, after composing sufficiently many norms, we find the product of elements that is a square. And because of that, there is very high chance that the product of uh, algebraic elements is also square. Oh yeah, I think I will, I'll skip this details. Uh, yes, so there are some explanations why uh, these numbers are uh, small. Uh, basically they are in current D about like n to the 0 0.4 and this is actually sufficient to give us this increase in the, the length of the number we can factor. Um, if we go to some concrete complexity, so we can translate these ideas into concrete complexity, and there is a very, well, bit uh, weird thing. So uh, if n is the number of bits, then this is the, uh, the formula. Then we have to take the square, the cubic root of the number of bits. We also have to take logarithm of the number of bits and take the power of 1 over 1.5. Uh, multiply all this by 2.4 and deduct 16. And this gives you the complexity in the way that the square root of this is the smoothness bound. So practically for recent factorizations, this is about like two to the 30 and this is about to the 60. To the 60 of what? That's of course a good question. But if we uh, translate it into core years using the recent factorization records, then we will see that uh, this is about 50 uh, so each element is about 50 CPU cycles. So it's some kind of basic uh, integer operation, big integer operation, uh, which gives you like, I think about 50 CPU cycles. So uh, this is the complexity of number field CIF, but this is just the computation complexity, the number of operations, but this doesn't tell us so far what's the complexity to break it in dollars. But that's uh, actually, of course, very interesting for us. What's the actual complexity to break this thing in dollars? We know uh, from recent factorization records uh, how many core years they have spent, but these core years are very, well, uh, but, but weird core years. So these are not GPU years. These are mainly uh, cluster years and clusters of different sizes in different countries, people are run by different people and so on. So these numbers are just aggregation of something. And this is not very precise, but what's interesting that the architecture here is, uh, well, IBM PC, to the big extent and uh, yeah, just normal clusters. 
uh, what we can do is we try we can try to translate the cost of the very cost of factoring this 900 core years into the electricity cost. So how we do this, we uh, take a number of years and we calculate how many hours, we calculate how much one core consumes energy and we calculate how much uh, one kilowatt hour costs. And eventually what I get is that uh, this seven, 795 bit number, it costs only, well only, uh, $8,000 worth of electricity. $8,000 worth of electricity. So. Uh, uh, electricity is not the dominating cost here, but we know from the mining that actually for very big computational efforts, electricity becomes uh, to dominate. And this actually means that these numbers from the electricity perspective, uh, these numbers are very small. So uh, from uh, the electricity, this costs like $8,000 and this costs uh, $30,000 of electricity. That's for, from practical point of view, it's not, it's not really big. And of course, we can expect that if proper amount of, uh, if proper funding is spent into that, we could see like if one decides to spend $1 million, then even on regular clusters, he can easily factor 900 bits or something. Uh, and on proper hardware, even probably more. Uh, what do I mean, uh, by the way, any questions so far? Yeah, I mean, I think this is very interesting. Maybe we should go through the numbers one by one so that we can um, properly understand them because like, yeah. Okay, so basically uh, I take number 900. Uh, this is uh, two to the 9.8. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then how many kilo hours in the year? Kilo hours mean thousands of hours. It's uh, eight uh, because yep. we have like, 25 hour, 24 hours per day, uh, 300 days, and so on. So it's about like eight kilo hours in the year. And then I take a rough estimate that one core in the cluster consumes about uh, 30, 50 watt. This yeah. of course not very precise. Uh, so it can go up and down a bit, like maybe a factor of two or something. And then I take uh, that one kilowatt hour in some uh, rich places, well, places where uh, electricity is cheap, for example, like near hydro plants, uh, there are numbers published by some hydro plants in the US that they can spend like four uh, cents. Uh, they can sell you uh, kilowatt hours, uh, four cents uh, by four cents each. And this basically means that uh, four or three, that, uh, uh, it's about to the minus five, uh, mm -hmm. about like one third of USD. Okay. Yeah, if you sounds... multiply this together, you get this number. Yeah, that sounds very reasonable. Okay. Um, so, uh, how uh, what we can expect from number fields if in this regards? So there are two main points here. So one thing is about seeing that on one hand we test O of B square integers for B smoothness and there are methods that do this uh, using O of B of memory and O of B square time. So O of B of memory is because we uh, need, uh, well, we store resultant B numbers, but uh, fortunately we don't have to store much more than that. So using a bit of parallelism and uh, uh, processing uh, segment by segment, we can uh, do this with O of B memory. But that memory access is not random, can be paralyzed, and memory is used predictably. And that's why I think that, and there are some kind of theoretical designs how uh, circuits can be constructed for uh, NFS. Uh, the problem here is that the current algorithms, current code for NFS may be rather sophisticated because there are like tons of improvements by a factor of two or three, how exactly we uh, go over these integers because there are pairs of them and and so on what we store what we do not store so some something optimized for a cluster and so on so there is a ton of bell and whistles here when we we might have to like dig up uh, to figure out how this can be properly implemented uh, on hardware but i'm pretty sure that uh, with a certain amount of research this can be figured out how you to do this on hardware problem. And One interesting for the comment here, like, yes. I mean, we know that basically 
the computations itself, we can probably expect a factor of a thousand to a million in reduction in electricity, right? From mining and so on. So, uh, yes. So that means that what we should look at is actually not the power consumption of the CPU because that will go almost to zero, but maybe just the power consumption of the memory and memory controllers. Yes, uh, and also another another thing is that we now have extrapolations uh, from uh, this amount of uh, core years, but the thing is the actual amount of computation. So this is not the amount of computation they they have done; is that how how much they have spent? But probably a big fraction of these core years were spent on I don't know. Uh, cache misses or memory accesses or whatever. So it's not, it doesn't mean that the number of operations is exactly uh, this number. So it's maybe because of x86 architecture, uh, this number can be reduced significantly in terms of the number of operations that is being done. So this complexity, the estimate that is here is based uh, on the assumption that these core years were spent entirely on computation. So if, if like only 1,000 uh, of them were spent for computation, then there should be a subtraction of another 10 uh, here in the, well, when we calculate the uh, worth of electricity and so on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then the second very important thing is uh, in linear case, so basically we find a kernel element uh, for metrics with O of B non-zero elements, and currently we spend it O of B squared time. But the thing is, and O of B memory, but the thing is, there are suggestions to have for like multi-core algorithms that uh, using the same amount of memory can do this in much smaller time. Maybe with at the expense of more random memory access, but still, if we can, uh, spend less time on the linear step. And this basically means that we can increase to balance these guys again. We can say if, if this step becomes much cheaper for some reason, then we can balance them by increasing the smoothness bound. And so that, oh, and with increasing the smoothness bound, we can <clears throat> um, break bigger integers, even using the same algorithms just by proper balancing uh, these things together. Do you see the point? So currently, both take b square, but if this takes not b square by, but b to the 1.5, then uh, clearly we can balance them together and use some different b so that they again use the same. So maybe we should, uh, test more integers so that the, uh, the smoothness probability is uh, different so that they have, they spent again, the steps spent uh, the same uh, time. But wh where does the B to the 1.5 come from? A B to 1.5 comes from uh, uh, parallel algorithms that uh, works with the sparse matrices. So there are suggestions by DGB, by Daniel Bernstein, uh, who suggested some parallel algorithms for uh, this block Wiedemann and block Lanzisch uh, exist in algorithms which are not very much parallel, but he has some suggestions. They are mostly theoretical ones, but it, mm, I think there are others uh, which can be made uh, uh, practical. So it's very uh, right. interesting. Um, but how would, how would parallelism help though? Because if we say what we estimate is the amount of electricity, then parallelism itself doesn't reduce that. Well, the, you see, so currently uh, the, uh, we, we spent B squared time and B memory. Uh, so that the electricity here spent for this is more like B cube. Uh, but if we spend uh, the same memory, but B to the 1.5 time, the electricity will not be B cube, but B uh, to the 2.5. So he basically suggests replacing some memory with cores and because of that reduce the overall computational time and thus reducing the overall electricity consumption. 
Wait, so you're assuming that the memory is always turned on? Is that the assumption? Because uh, I, th I think there's memories now where you basically only pay an electricity cost when you want to access them. Yes, yes, there are uh, static and dynamic uh, RAM. And it's, of course, a very uh, right and very interesting question. So which one should be used here? I think it depends on the algorithm, which kind of memory you use, because some, I think the one that uh, you pay only for, uh, you can turn it on and off, it, I think it's bigger. Uh, and by itself, it requires a bit more space and chip and so on. I mean, SRAM is crazy expensive. I don't expect anyone would use it. Yeah, it's also expensive, but if you run it for a year, maybe it's worth it. I mean, my impression is you literally can't get gigabytes of SRAM at the moment. It's so crazy. Like it's, it's several orders of magnitude in between. Several orders. I heard yeah, it that, differently, but that's I'm not my understanding too. Okay. Well, I think that there. Uh, but uh, I mean, I don't think that's a, such a big deal because even even DRAM, the cost when you don't use it is actually not that high. You have to refresh it, but I mean, it is very low. I mean, like a good laptop doesn't really significantly drain its battery in standby, and it still refreshes its DRAM. Yeah, I remember there is like a fraction of 10 or something electricity you need. Oh, m much higher than that, I think. I think we're oh. talking much, much more than that. Okay, I'm totally not an expert here, but I would really love to talk with some experts <laughs> about all this. I mean, one thing to consider maybe is like there's this memory from Intel called Optane memory. And from what I understand, it doesn't need any refreshing. Um, so it's like persistent memory, but works a bit like, like RAM. Okay. It is, but it's still a lot slower than RAM as well. Well, it's like a, between you, SSD and RAMs. Right. But it's not that much slower. It's like a small constant. Um, more, more than 10, right? That small constant. Uh, I thought it was less than ten. I thought it was something like five, but uh, I need to check, I guess. Okay, uh, shall we go on, maybe? Sure. I mean, one question I had, you know, you, you mentioned the extrapolation from the existing numbers. Yes. How much variance is there in the runtime? Like, can you get super lucky and just complete your algorithm really quickly or, or not? I don't think so because um, no. basically you, you have to collect uh, uh, quite many relations, quite many uh, smooth integers here. Right. And so your only chance is to find some submetrics that is linearly dependent. So like, so that you actually does, you don't need all the B numbers, all the B prime numbers to give you the solution. It's like what I had in my example. In my example, I had that right. I need only three and five, so I didn't need two, but uh, the chance for, for this to happen is not so high, I think in, in real uh, numbers. Uh, and there are actually, um, it's much more likely that you will have some parasitic uh, solutions uh, or pseudo solutions if you have to filter out so that uh, as far as I know, people even create numbers of matrices with much more rows than needed because otherwise uh, there are, they get some solutions that they, they don't, really, don't really work. Right. Okay. Uh, so what else interesting that i i try to make some estimates uh for example in one case as i just extrapolated from uh the current cpu fructization record and in other cases i 
I tried to figure out what the maximum ASIC advantage could be. So I got that if we talking about cores, cluster cores that span like 30 watt, then uh, the biggest advantage I think would be about uh, about a thousand um, in uh, uh, the electricity advantage. I mean, there are some more detailed calculations in my uh, in my paper in my report. I will send the link soon for the, for the ones who haven't seen it. So um, I also uh, computed. Um, so I for some conservative. Uh, scenario, I, I added some small advances like to the two to the three into the uh, uh, algorithms improvement and uh, you know, some variant of Moore's law and so on. Uh, so they don't uh, differ significantly, but there was, there was also a super conservative scenario where uh, I analyzed uh, the case when uh, we, we have found this uh, uh, b to the 1.5 time uh, algorithm for 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 matrices, and then I tried to estimate the security in bits. So how I did that? I I took 80 bit AS key and I tried to figure out. So if you take the current Bitcoin hash power, uh, how much it would cost uh, if the same if we don't run a SHA-256 there, but AS, how much it would cost in terms of electricity? Uh, to break ATBTAS, and I actually got that you would have spent uh, fifty thousand dollars for this uh, using current mining as well before the fall. Five hundred thousand. Uh, Five hundred thousand, yes, but it was for Bitcoin price uh, a month ago. <laughs> um, and then the one hundred twenty-eight bit security. Uh, it's reasonably that it's cost of one hundred twenty-eight bit recover key recovery in ASIC, which is about two sixty-seven USD. Which is of course beyond our capabilities, uh, and but what is 256-bit security? 256. I say that uh, the system has 256-bit security if it becomes 128-bit secure if you cut out half of uh, the key, or if all algorithms get quadratic speed up. That's actually the same. So, and in this uh, circumstance, uh, I analyze uh, the. A perspective of uh, different module sizes, and here are the numbers. So you see that uh, in this metric, uh, if we uh, stick to CPUs, to the clusters on which the most recent uh, numbers are broken, then 80 bit security is 950 bit, uh, and 128 bit security is 2850 bit. But if you consider a conservative scenario where you have some advances in ASIC uh, bringing you 1,000 uh, reduction, 1,000 factor in the reduction of electricity cost, then 80 bits uh, is not 900 uh, uh, bit number, but 1,500 bit. And 128 bit security is uh, 1,000 uh, bits more uh, for uh, the number. To be broken. This is the RSA model that have both prime numbers. Um, and super conservative scenario is if we found uh, this uh, advanced hardware algorithm for matrices, then we basically have all our modular sizes increased by uh, a bit uh, 30, uh, 20 percent or something. And also there's this uh, table is in the report for the ones. I have two extras. Uh, there is a slide about elliptic curve factoring method, and there is a slide about discrete logarithm. Uh, basically, yeah, I'll skip elliptic curves. And for discrete logarithm, the principle is quite similar. So what they basically do, if if you want to find discrete logarithm of some uh, num of some element of a prime field, if you talk about prime field, uh, if you want to logarithm h with respect to the base g. Then you generate uh, many uh, he, many uh, exponents he, and we test if the number is this smooth with the same sieving principle. And after you find sufficiently many such this smooth numbers, you compose the same linear system. And basically, for every you you get the discrete logarithm for every uh, number in this uh, factoring base. So for every, you you logarithm every prime number smaller than b. And um, after you've done that, so how to fact how to discrete logarithm this guy, you uh, 
uh, take different tiles. Wait, how, how do you do that? How do you compute the logarithm? Ah, well, uh, you, uh, if you find B uh, such guys, then you have your, the same matrix actually, but you, uh, you call the columns, so you compute your uh, linear dependency, not modulo two, but modulo pi, P minus one. So if uh, the prime field is P, then basically means that uh, all the exponents that they wrap around uh, P minus one. And uh, if you have uh, uh, different, if you have uh, O of B, B smooth exponents with a different he, then uh, basically uh, you can uh, uh, solve a linear system and uh, well, this linear system, the unknowns will be uh, actually these guys, and uh, you will find it uh, by uh, Gaussian elimination. Okay, so you compute the logarithms of all your primes. Now that's actually the last slide. Right, you compute the logarithms of all the primes and then you just keep on kind of randomizing h until you make h be smooth and then you, you figure out what the, the discrete log is. Yes. Any questions on the entire talk? I mean, as, as Dan had said, I imagine the electricity costs for, for ASICs will be somewhere between a thousand and a million. A thousand being the kind of the, the less conservative estimate as opposed to the conservative one. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one interesting exercise would be um, that we could do trivially now um, would be to just look at the consumption, the electricity consumption of memory. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, but I, uh, I think that will give you a factor of 2 to the 5 already, because I suspect it's about 1 watt or something like that instead of 2 to the 5 watt. So what I, for example, I've calculated myself uh, that there is this proof of work equihash, uh, which requires for Zcash about 200 megabytes of RAM. And if you take ASICs for them, then- uh, How much RAM again? 200 megabytes? 200 megabytes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and uh, basically what you do with the RAM is sorting. So you just kind of radix sort your your RAM several times. That's how mm -hmm. uh, this in general works. And uh, the advantage uh, in terms over a regular CPU over a laptop mm -hmm. is about 1000. Okay. Yeah. I mean, another question is, does it all have to be in the same memory? Like, because the problem is if you need high bandwidth, then you probably have quite a bit of power consumption. If you can lower your bandwidth requirements, that would be less. What if you could split it across 1000 different memories with all much lower bandwidth requirements and can merge it all together? Like for example, do all the saving steps for different primes on different hardware and merge the results together at a later step. Is that possible? Yeah, that's possible. I think that's what's actually being done uh, right. by all these uh, factorization teams. 
because that in that runs... case you can probably like lower your bandwidth requirements extremely and go with much lower power requirements for memory and i think you will end up with something very low already like in normal computers memory isn't actively cooled right by that you know it doesn't really consume that much power and in laptops already much less so i think yeah yes i mean factor of thousand seems easily possible there but even outside of the the hardware question is like the algorithmic question it, it it is very scary, you know, that maybe some sort of aversive algorithm comes out and has a slightly better asymptotic complexity, and that completely changes everything. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. a good point. I think, um, as far as I understand, in the factor and the integers, uh, not much progress has been made in the last uh, twenty years. But uh, in discrete logarithm, there have been many different approaches because there are dis different algorithms for prime fields. There are diff other types of algorithms for extensions of prime, field, of prime fields, which are important for pairing-based crypto. Uh, there are algorithms for fields of characteristic two, and so on. So there are like several groups of these algorithms, and they all uh, follow this number field if and one on another regard. So, so I think that if they have found some something really really important that would be translated probably uh, to the number field safe but on the other hand this the algorithm is itself pretty uh complex i think it's uh the fact why it works it requires significant uh algebraic background so the code itself is not that that difficult but uh, as far as i understand the authors they spent uh, several years uh, just to uh, make all assumptions uh, realistic. So they they basically had to add a few more components to uh, to the to the procedure before it start it uh, started working for every integers. In the beginning, it worked only for very specific types of integers, like two to the two to the n plus one or something like this. And to make it for all integers, they uh, have to go through sufficiently many obstacles. So it's a really difficult problem and yeah, I think no one can estimate if there is a breakthrough in the upcoming years regarding that. When, when, when did this happen? When was this kind of... Uh, from 90 to 93. Okay. And uh, one of the prominent guys in this uh, research was uh, Leonard Adleman. You may remember that in RSA, there are Rivest, Rivest, mm -hmm. Shamir, and Tedleman. And mm -hmm. some people say that Tedleman did the minimal amount of work, uh, but still is included into the RSA a list of authors. But I think as far as I understand, this has been very well compensated by, by his contribution to the factory. <laughs> he is one of the people, uh, like of very few people who made this NFS really possible. So I, I would also be really interested in your judgment as a cryptographer. So we know that kind of, it seems like the progress has slowed there. And I guess there's the two different competing theories. One is, oh yeah, we are kind of at the edge and there isn't that much more improvement possible. And the other theory is like the bar by NFS is set so high that like it would be crazy for a young cryptographer now to go into factoring because like they would have to spend so much time just getting there and it wouldn't be that likely that they find a new algorithm. I wonder what your judgment on that is. Yeah, I think that's even, it's not a cryptographer actually program problem uh, in fact. So I think it's much more a mathematical problem because there is almost no cryptography involved in that. And there are like some deep uh, mathematics things involved. Like when you, for example, when you try to read about this imaginary uh, quadratic groups, 
it, it's pretty much uh, similar. So you would have to have like really deep understanding of algebra before you figure out how all this works. And I think just to improve that it's really an ambitious task. And we don't have that many mathematicians these days, right? So as far as I understand, the number of working mathematicians is a bit decreasing. So many people go into more applied science whereas this factoring is, is actually more theoretical. So my gut feeling is that we shouldn't expect uh, real uh, advances from the theoretical side, but we definitely should expect some advances in practical side. So when I see this uh, sparse linear algorithms and this sieving done on uh, regular CPUs, I feel that it can be much, much more sped up. If so, if, if some person who is confident in uh, number field C if talks to a person confident in a silicon design, I think they, within a few days, they will quickly figure out uh, how to uh, make this uh, you know, on hardware uh, much, much faster. That's my gut feeling. Okay, interesting. But the, the other question is basically, um, so you said you don't expect um, huge progress right now. But it sounds like that's not because you think there's there is nothing out there to be discovered, but there's nobody who's going to work on it now. Is yeah, that? yeah, something like this. I think people who are closer to the discrete logarithm uh, research could give a, more, a better, better answer because there there are some advances there. Uh, there were there have been some advances, uh, maybe not in this particular case, but in some in some like sister algorithms, there there was an advance. Maybe they can they can tell a bit better about like the unexplored area and some potential to use them in NFS factoring. So one question I have is that you seem to have focused a lot on the cost of electricity. Are you is the claim that this totally dominates? relative to the cost of hardware? Oh, yeah, I think so. Because, uh, well, the hardware itself, so if we, if we talk about numbers like, uh, what was that? 3,000 core years. So what's, what's, like, if it's a month, uh, this means like, uh, uh, I know, 30,000 uh, 30, cores. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, uh, I don't know, 30,000 cores, what it is, $3 million maybe, I think even cheaper. Uh, so of course, the, well, it's, it's more expensive than this, this, course, this cost of electricity. But when we uh, talk about uh, uh, custom hardware, I think uh, if we, uh, take a chip of some moderate say, size, I'd know 10 by 10 centimeters or something, and uh, imagine constructing, I'd know, a million of these chips for factoring. I, I'm pretty sure that their cost will be smaller than uh, uh, the cost of running time. If we talk about millions of dollars spent for this, so the design will be, I don't know, several millions, and the chips themselves may be also several, mil several millions, but the amortized cost will be small, I'm pretty sure, and uh, uh, the electricity consumption uh, can be really huge if we talk about, I know, hundreds of millions of dollars for electricity. Mm, I'm, I don't know, I'm not totally convinced. Um, Because I mean, for the, the power consumption, that can really go down a very significant amount, let's say between a thousand and a million. But then the area, which is going to be your cost, um, that it's less clear that it would go down significantly. Area will not go down, but if we can live with the rather small chips, then we can uh, put significant amount of them on the die and then we can leave with the reasonable failure probability. So if they're not like meter by meter, then uh, I think their 
production can be uh, amortized significantly. But I, I'm I'm not an expert on that, of course. So that's just. I mean, I guess. I mean, I think asymptotically, you are certainly right. Depending, like, if we assume that um, that you have a reasonable, like, assume you are okay with factoring it in one year, I would say, like, if you want to factor it in one week or one month, like, A's up and you only have one number to factor, I would say very likely the cost of hardware will actually dominate because you're basically only running all your hardware for that amount of time. But yeah. like... Also because you won't be able to design proper hardware within this time frame. Right. Because um, if, if you know what number to factor, you can optimize your hardware already for that number significantly, I think. Mm, that's also a good, good point, yeah. Wait, so that is our, our situation. So what is the speed up if you're ready, if you design your hardware specifically for this number? Where do you get gains? That's a good question. I think it is, oh, well, uh, we all have this model reductions, right? So I think the, the model, where this number is used in, in, in model reductions. And uh, if uh, model reduction circuits can be optimized given a particular number, then uh, we can win there. So all these factorization records, of course, they knew which number to broke to break, but I think they couldn't really exploit it because they just use the regular CPUs. But on custom hardware, I think if you can uh, hard code uh, the the number into the model reduction circuit, you should get some benefit. Okay, if it's only the modular multiplication, then I think you get roughly a two x advantage for hard-coded versus programmability, in, both in terms of area and in terms of electricity consumption. Yeah, of course, I'm constant factor. Yeah. Okay. Mm, so wait, but I mean, the numbers you square are of a very specific form. Like it's like root n plus epsilon. Uh, for mm, quadratic I, CF, yes. Oh, I see. Uh, but not for the number field CF. Uh, there, I think a bit different. There's a you don't, I'm not sure you square there. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, anyway, I think that would not be my sort of main worry. I mean, another way to look at these uh, security assumptions is just to, because you know we talk in terms of dollars, but but maybe like the bottleneck is actually just how much electricity the world could produce. Um, so I'd be curious to know like how, how much electricity is the world producing, and if it was hundred percent of the electricity dedicated to this problem, how much time would it take to factor, and is that more or less than ten years? And if it's more than ten years, then you know we're definitely safe. Unless there's some sort of well, but I mean, like, please always, these are always estimates, like, you always need a right margin of security, yeah, yeah. 10, <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, no, 10 is not an, enough of a margin of security. Well, I mean, 10 okay. years it, and a factor of thousand, I would say, and, if, would and whatever different. factor you want, yes. Because the dollar amounts are always very kind of difficult to reason about, I guess. But you know, e energy and time is more kind of physical. Okay, so 21 trillion kilowatt hours. A trillion is 10 to the 12. So two times 10 to the 13 kilowatt hours. Per year, it's current worldwide electricity consumption. Okay. Anyway, we can do, this, do these estimates as well later. Yeah.
Okay, but anyway, all of this is pointing me towards the 3,000 bits and, and avoiding the <laughs> thousands. <laughs> That's my gut feel. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Dimitri. This was very, very well prepared and very understandable. Very good. Yeah, at least for me. And uh, I think I, yeah, I understand it you. much, much yeah, better now. Very helpful. Yeah, same here. Yeah, thank you for your time, guys.